Hey guys, my name is Chloe and I'm a private pilot and today I'm going to tell you all about my private pilot check ride. So first of all, I'm making this video for fun, for entertainment. Hopefully it'll help anybody that is preparing for their private pilot check ride. I know for me it was a very intimidating, nerve-wracking process to prepare for my check ride and I would sometimes listen to videos just like these on YouTube and they would help me out and they would relieve some of the tension. It's definitely mystifying your private pilot check ride because it's the first one of hopefully a long career in aviation where you we're going to go through a lot of check rides. I've only done one so far, but that's my trajectory is aviation and I know that I'll be going through a ton of check rides in my life. But the private pilot check ride takes you from not being a pilot to being a pilot. And it's the first one you do. So it's definitely um it's definitely like a a mystical thing, right? You hear about it and you want to know what it's like and there's no way to know what it's like other than to go through it. So I became a private pilot on February 21st, 2024. I passed the practical that day. I had actually taken the oral on January 28th, 2024. So my check ride was split um, the oral on January 28th and then on February 21st, the practical. I did that on purpose. I actually had driven to my check ride on the 20 on January 28th knowing I was going to do that. Why? Because I was freaking exhausted. You guys from the day my CFI signed me off, it was the first week in January. I went into crazy study mode. I had done the knowledge test in January 2023. So a lot of the the minutia, the details of the private pilot material were in the background of my life. They were tucked away in my brain somewhere and I had to pull them out. You know, I'm talking about the difference between hypemic hypoxia, hypoxic hypoxia, histotoxic hypoxia, the difference between pressure altitude and indicated altitude and true altitude and density altitude, the difference um, between mixed ice and rime ice and clear ice and what to do in the event of, now I'm in Florida, so I never dealt with icing, but you get the idea. All of the small details that I didn't need to think about as I did my training, right? There were those were the things that were part of the knowledge test, but for the oral, I mean, the DP is definitely going to go over things to that level of detail and you got to know. And so um yeah, I started studying like crazy. I bought Jason Shepard's Pass Your Private Pilot check ride um on audiobook and honestly, instead of sleeping, I for all those weeks I would kind of go into a light trance at night with that on every single night. Um, and every single second, I'm not kidding, that I was not at work. I also work, I work at the airport as well. A, a very, very um, high level, high responsibility position. Um, so I was very stressed with that as well. I just want to add that as a side note, but every minute, every second I was not at work, I would be studying. I had that far aim out. I was, um, with the Michael Hayes book. I'm sure that you guys know that little blue book, um, uh, oral exam prep or whatever it's called. It's that little blue book. I was constantly studying. I had on YouTube, all my YouTube recommended was all private pilot oral check ride prep material all of it all of it um uh you know and also training still I was still seeing my CFI still training because I really didn't I until basically like a day or like the day of my check ride I thought I was going to be doing you know everything in one day and the morning that I woke up on January 28th after all the studying and, and the lack of sleep and I wasn't eating because I had lost my appetite and I was so skinny and sleep deprived. I was actually, honestly, I was scared to get in the car. That's how absolutely burnt out I was. I was scared to get in the car to drive to the airport to do my check ride. So I told myself before I left, there's no way I'm going to be flying today. I'm just going to do the oral. And that is exactly what I did. And as far as the practical was concerned, I blamed some IFR air mets that were like way 
not even close to where we would be going, but that were like on the cross country in parts I knew we'd never get to. <laughs> the DPE was like, he, he like leveled with me. He's like, you know, we're not really going to go over there. If you want, we can just, you know, we don't have to worry about those air mats. Basically. I'm glad you, you know, you became aware of them and you did your briefing and you got your standard briefing, but we're not going to have to worry about those. And I was like, you know what? I said to him, honestly, I said, I'm beat. I'm exhausted. And I did ended up, yeah, I ended up, I started with the IFR air med thing. And then I was just like, I can't, I'm so freaking exhausted. I'm falling asleep right here, right now. And he was cool. Um, actually, I'll actually, I'll tell you more about that little conversation um, at the end of uh, me telling you about the oral, which was crazy. It was six and a half hours. I was actually under the impression that if you did really well on the knowledge test, I got a 97, that you wouldn't get so raked over the coals um, by your DPE. But then I learned that if you get a really high score, you can, the DPE may rake you over the coals because they may assume that you've memorized things or that you think you're so smart and they're going to show you what you don't know, which is, by the way, that's what goes on in the oral. They want to see, they don't care about what you know. They want to know what you don't know. So, yeah, I don't know what's the right, like, number to hit on the knowledge test for them to not go so hard on you because, obviously, if you get a 70 or, like, a 71, they're going to have all those codes come up and be like, why don't you know this? You know, and they're going to go through a lot of stuff. But then again, if you get a really high score, they may take the route, which Jay Lawrence, my DPE, took with me, which was to go crazy asking me questions. Um, it was the two questions I had gotten wrong on, on, the, or on the knowledge test were I had to do with maintenance log books and, like, the, the 100 hour and when to check the ELT and the transponder and that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, he, I think he asked me, about 90 minutes worth of questions just on that stuff alone. So that was how actually the day started with the maintenance log books. And it was really um, intense. And he did not give, and throughout the whole six and a half hours, he very rarely gave any indication on his face as to whether or not what I was saying was right or wrong. You know, you're used to in a normal conversation, even if the person is very quiet and you're very chatty, the person's going to give some recognition. You're going to get some recognition on their face as to whether they agree with you or not, right? And he was not doing nothing. He had no facial expression. I even said to him at one point, I'm like, you have mastered the inscrutable expression. You are really good at that. <laughs> and he, he nearly laughed when I said that. But, um, uh, yeah, so it was tough. Um, he, so, okay. All right, I'll tell you how the day started. So the day started at 8 o'clock in the morning with him coming up to me and saying, so, you like to commit fraud? And I had, guys, I had no freaking idea what he was talking about. All I knew was that that was just, like, <laughs> like not the vibe I wanted. I was already tired, you know, walking into it, tired. And I'm like, what the fuck is he talking? What, the fraud? So he went berserk over the fact that, um... My student pilot license had my middle name, Michelle, spelled out. But on my driver's license, only my middle initial, M, is shown. And he was going on about how if there was a ramp inspection, how, do, how does the FAA or whoever know that I'm not Chloe Marie? I, I was like, there's no Jewish woman on earth named Marie. And he almost laughed at that too, but he stopped himself. Anyway, he went berserk over it. And I had to like promise him... And swear on a Torah that I wasn't going to ever, that I was going to go right to the DMV rather. And I was going, and I would, you know, make it a priority to get my full middle name spelled out. Oh my God. Oh my God. It was crazy. So then anyway, so then the maintenance logbook fiasco and all that. I was already so nervous when we sat down to do the oral from him telling me that I like to commit fraud. That I was shaking by the time we started with the oral and um I honestly like after all the studying and everything that I had done to get prepared for this thing I felt like I knew nothing when I sat there the first like hour or so with you know all the nervousness I don't even I'm not sure if I ate well I don't I wasn't eating really that much I was just a mess 
by hook or by crook, I got through it um, without him giving me any feedback. Uh, much of the time I had to... In the beginning, I was... Because he wasn't giving me feedback, I was... I was second guessing myself a lot. Like I would say something and I go, "Oh, was that right?" And then he would still not give me any expression. And then of course I would start to go, "Maybe that wasn't right, or maybe this is right instead." And then I'm like, "Oh my God, Chloe, stop it!" So I when I I had to stop doing that. I had to just say what I meant and let it stand. And if it was right, it was right. If it was wrong, it was wrong. And watch him take his little notes, which freaked me out. Um, so it went on and on and on. And then the last 20 minutes were extremely, extremely intense. First of all, all of a sudden, after six hours and 10 minutes, he goes, okay, the oral is done. I was like, oh my God, oh my God. It was like so sudden. And then he goes, just one more question. And he asked me about an engine fire. What would I do in the event of an engine fire? So I took him through the emergency engine engine fire procedures which is to uh, turn a fuel selector goes off. I think it uh, mixture goes lean. Um, you pitch for V and O, maximum structural cruising speed, and you go 30, 30, 30, 30. And he goes, okay, well, that didn't work. Now you're at 1,500 feet. The engine's still on fire. What do you do? And I'm like thinking, I gave him the right answer. I don't know what else to say. And so I go squawk 77 and hit 1215 and declare an emergency. He goes, okay, so you're dead. I was like, what? He goes, you're dead. So you're dead. You decided that you're going to squawk 77 and hit 1215. And now you and your passenger are dead. And he kept saying dead. And he told was talking to me about how he was going to call my parents and tell them I was dead. And about the eulogy and the obit. And, I, and like freaking me out. And he's like, you're dead. You're dead. You decided because you decided. You, and he kept saying, repeating that it was my decision and I was so freaked out. I was like, oh my God, I failed. Thinking I failed. Like, there's no way I did not fail just now because he's not going to tell me that my decision led to the death of my passenger and myself and then be like, oh yeah, you passed the oral. No. So <laughs> I'm looking at him like, I must have looked like a ghost. And he was like, all right, tell you what, I'm going to go to the bathroom and you figure out how to make yourself undead. And I was like, okay. So he goes to the bathroom and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell him. Pitch for VNE. That was the only thing I could think of. So he comes back. He looks at me and I go, pitch for VNE. And he goes, oh, you're not dead anymore. And I was like, fuck. Oh my God. Then he was like, if you're going to, if your engine's on fire, you pitch for VNE. You don't give a crap about the going, the never exceed speed. You pitch for that. I'm like, okay, heard and copied. I, if God forbid that should happen, that is what I will do. So then I, he told me that I, I, he asked me, by the way, he asked me, did you, do you, do you think you passed the oral? And I was just like, yeah. And then uh, he had still no expression. I said, did I pass? And then he started looking through all his notes from the beginning of the day and all the stupid things I said. And when I double backed in myself and all the idiotic things, and then and I'm looking at him like, oh my God, like, I, just tell me. And finally he he um he says so did you pass and it was like a rhetorical question and i didn't say anything and then he goes yep like just like that oh my god you guys i'm reliving it right now it was so ridiculously dramatic and and i was just all, i was feeling all kinds of joy and relief and just oh my god oh my god so, and then he was, like, pressuring me to fly. He's like, oh, come on. You know, I told him about the air meds. And then I was like, screw it. I'm beat. I'm honestly, I can't fly. I'm so tired right now. And he goes, oh, just drink some coffee and let's get out of here. I was like, no, I'm tired. He goes, come on. I said, no. He goes, good. All right. One last test, right? All right. So the thing gets, like, scheduled and rescheduled a bunch. Because let me tell you something, guys. If let me tell you something I wish I had I had considered more before I decided to cut the check ride into two different days um if you're gonna go and do that and if you need to do that do it your PIC you do that but no you it's very hard to line up these three things the plane the weather and the DPE 
it's very hard to line those three things up again and you have 60 days to do it before your oral basically expires and you have to do that again with the practical so yeah not to mention all the flying i had to keep flying i'm not gonna just stop flying so i kept flying ended up you know when i did all the math roughly 2300 more dollars that i spent flying with my instructor over those next many weeks to stay proficient because i mean you only need three proficiency hours i think it's within it's either 60 or 90 days of the practical um but i wanted to fly as much as possible so um i kept flying and it was scheduled rescheduled finally the 21st i got my date and um by the by the morning of the 21st when i met jay on the ramp i was so over thinking about it i was so over dwelling on it i was just so over all of it i just thought to myself i just need to fly this dude around the county and call it a freaking day already okay that's all you gotta do. and i i had so much more there was so much more lightness about me and a sense of humor about the entire thing because i was so over it <laughs> not not over it. i still wanted to be a pilot but i was like over the anxiety part you know so <clears throat> so I, I saw him on the ramp i said jay we're gonna have an uneventful day um i'm gonna take off we'll fly around and we'll come and we'll do whatever you want me to do and we'll land and that'll be it he loved the word uneventful he kept repeating it he loved it it was like tasty to him right and you so use that word by the way that's a good word dpe's like that we're going to have an uneventful day we will take off fly and land completely uneventfully i said because i have things to do after this you have things to do after this it's going to be uneventful he loved it so um so right so we take off and i hit my waypoints you guys it was amazing when i say exactly i don't i don't just mean to the minute i mean to the second because i did all my waypoints to the second and i had i don't I, I was like was this like am i seeing things i'm looking at my watch and i'm hitting them to the very second i even commented to jay i'm like oh my god like holy guacamole i am hitting every waypoint to the second i'm like i'm good i even said that to him i'm like i'm really good <laughs> And he was like, okay. Like, he had, like, this, he has this funny, he's a character. He has a really funny voice. And then because I had done so well with the waypoints, um, he was like, okay, scrapping the cross country. I see you know how to flight plan. He asked me to do slow flight. I did slow flight. Then he tried to get me to do a, a steep turn into a restricted area by over by Lake George. I said, that's not going to happen. I said, I'm not going over there. I'm going to fly over there more to the west. And um, he liked that. And then diverted him to key he wanted me to divert him to keystone heights we did that i went over there was in the pattern a bunch um every time i was on final and short final particularly on short final he would start talking about random crap about how he went to a mexican restaurant and the corn salsa was over was uh was too salty and then he bought his wife a bracelet and they're gonna have to and they they need to bring their car in for maintenance like all this crap like i'm like i'm trying to land a plane do you mind like I, it was actually really funny but um yeah so we did a bunch of takeoffs and landings in the pattern um my soft field landing was as good as it gets for me and my soft field landing there are, my soft field landings are still need a little bit of work but yeah he was it was within standard we went we're we go, um, start going back east to St. Augustine, um, and that's when things started getting a little bit hairy. So, um, <laughs> so we're going back to St. Augustine, and um, he goes, he pulls the power, he goes, okay, engine out, and we started to argue a little bit over the best place to put the plane down, and um, that's when things started getting kind of bad. So, and eventually... Right, so we were like towards the latter part of the practical of the check ride. It was, it was like, it felt honestly like a just a regular flight with my CFI, totally normal, even easier. Jay was less chirpy than my, or less chatty rather. I love my CFI, love him, love, love, love. No chirpy, but chirpy, I mean it in the most endearing way. He was less chirpy and chatty than my CFI, right? So, but 
it was all going really nice and then the emergency landing and the like a little bit of a tiff over where to land and we didn't quite agree and then um i recovered us to 200 feet and then when i went uh, I, I put full power we were climbing at like a snail's pace and i was like um like thinking like what the heck is wrong with this engine and he goes what could possibly be going on in the plane right now that's making us climb this way? And I'm like thinking, I'm like, fuck, I don't know. Like, what is going on with the engine? Guys, I never put the flaps back. I The flaps were up. <laughs> I never put that. I was climbing with 40 degrees of flaps. And I was like, oh, my God. And I, was, I said to him, I am the dumbest pilot ever. And he didn't say anything. I think he nodded, actually. <laughs> So then, oh my god. So we get back. All right, I was going to like scrap some details. All right, so we get back to 10 miles of the airport, 10 miles outside. I get the weather. I called tower. And then we had been at 3,500 feet. So I started our descent because at nine miles out because my CFI taught me the law of three where if you're like, at 3,500 feet, you start descending at 9 miles. You are at 4,500 feet, you start at 12. And that's how you calculate when you start your descent. He goes, why are you descending us? Why are you descending us at, at 9 miles out? I'm like, because my CFI told me that. He's like, he's like, your CFI, you know, is this. And he was like, getting really angry. And he goes, put that power back in there. Climb us back up. And I'm like, okay, okay. So then he he was like, your, that, your descent procedure is going to kill us and all this crap. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like this is not good. So later he told me, by the way, that he's, his rationale is that if you cut, if you start descending, quote unquote, that far out, okay, that if you lose an engine by St. Augustine, you're screwed. But... Anyway, uh, anyway, okay, so maybe that's true. So, um, I, he want, basically, you guys, he preferred a descent from, like, 3,500 feet about, maybe you start about four miles out. So, you're going to have to, like, drop, like, a rock. In, anyways, so, point is, he didn't like that I was starting a descent so far. So, anyway, we get into the downwind for 3-1, and he asked me just point blank, randomly, out of the sky, if I am a Democrat or a Republican. And I'm like, oh, shit. There's no good answer to this. <laughs> because whatever, I'm thinking whatever I say, he's going to say, he's going to hate. And sure enough, I gave him an answer. He hated it. And then I'm like, crap. So I just started talking shit about the political party that I just said I was a part of. <laughs> I was like, I don't care. I'll, I will throw my guy under a bus right now. I am trying to pass a check ride, and um, yeah. So <laughs> that was so uncomfortable. And then we're on the downwind, and ATC says to look out for a aircraft on base, turning base to final. Um, I, I I don't even know if he gave like directions, but the guy was about my, oh God, I want to say like seven o'clock. And I didn't know to look that far behind me. So I'm looking, probably I only look, like, turn my head to a point of, like, maybe, like, I don't know. Turn my head to the left at around maybe, like, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. And I didn't see him. And I'm like, I don't see the guy. And Jay was like, look, look harder, look. And then he grabbed the control. He didn't even say my controls. He grabs the controls, shoves the plane around. He goes, look. And I'm like, okay, I see it. I saw the plane turning base to final. It was already on final. I'm like, okay. He goes, you have to put your head on a swivel. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I am failing this thing. So anyway, I turned to base, base to final. And I'm like, oh, let me do my pre-lining checklist, which I totally had forgot. I, guys, I completely forgot about it. And and I'm doing it. He goes, hmm, pre-lining checklist on final. Hmm, is this the right place to do it? I said, no, it probably should have been done on the downwind. Hmm, I would say so. I was like, oh my god, I, this is it. Like, it's over. <laughs> then he sticks his foot. Listen to this. We were far out. It was a long final because I was... If you fly in the SGJ... So we were on... Uh, it, was on the, it was on final for 3-1. I was all the way by the coastline. So it's basically the edge of the airspace. So I'm not going to start putting flaps in before... 
like when we were turning the base or anything. So I, I, I'm on final. I'm starting to put the flaps in. And in before I could even touch him, I'm in a warrior, right? He sticks his foot on the flaps. And I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm like, what? Like, what is this? So I said to him, what, what's going on? He goes, you tell me. I'm like, um, do I have to punch your lights out right now? Like, how does this work? And he was like, do whatever you need to do. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have to either punch this guy or land clean. So I landed clean, and then I missed my radio call. And I was like, oh, my God. ATC actually sighed at me. They were like, oh, two-hit x-ray. <laughs> you missed your radio call. I'm like, thanks for the attitude. And <laughs> it was just, I was sure I failed. I was sure that I failed. He did not say a word to me as we taxied back to the ramp he did not he as soon as I shut the plane down he jumped out of the plane and ran away and I texted my CFI I said I failed that's it it's over and my CFI was like what why do you think you failed and I said because he didn't say a word to me after as we were taxiing back and he just ran out of the plane he said that means you passed I was like what he said with that DPE that means you passed I was like, yeah, right. So I'm walking, because I'm like, no, there's no way. Like, maybe in every other case, but not with me. So um, I'm walking back to school, just like thinking, oh, this is it. Like, he's going to, I don't know what he's going to tell me, but it's not going to be good. And I was like, really, I was just miserable. I was already miserable thinking about it. and, And that's when I see two of the school admin walking towards me and they had huge smiles on their faces and one of them was holding a white piece of paper and I'm like what is going on and and they go look I said what I was so scared I'm like is that the letter of disapproval like did they already print it out and they were like look and I looked and it was my temporary airman certificate the DPE already printed it out at the school you guys I I I just dropped everything that was in my hands and I said no 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 because I I I couldn't I I was like I cannot believe this I'm a pilot I did it I passed and then when we got and we did the debrief um he was like you need to stop listening to your CFI and anybody else and you need to start you need to start getting in touch with your own procedures because he basically accused me of like trying to be a clone of my CFI and not using my own head and listening to my CFI too much and I'm like I thought I was supposed to listen to him but no he was like no and you're the only way for you to stop all that is for you to go out and fly on your own and gain experiences by yourself and I was like okay and then uh he said and by the way I didn't I didn't help you to push the plane back because I only help students tie up planes I don't help captains and I was just like wow I, this guy Jay Lawrence is a he he is he is no joke um and he he said that to me and I I was uh, I was overwhelmed overwhelmed you guys it, and then the first thing I did was I booked a plane for myself for like uh, cross country and just to stay in the pattern a little bit because I didn't want to just say, oh, I'm a pilot now, and that's it. That's where the journey ends. Oh, a pilot flies, you know, a pilot flies. So that's the first thing I thought about doing was flying. Um, It took me a while to believe that it was real. I think it took me like two or three weeks to be like, okay, I'm I'm a I'm a pilot. It's it's not it's (laughs) it's reality now, you know. And it was a really intimidating experience. The very very first time I ever went out to the ramp by myself as a private pilot, and I flew around the um, I flew around the the traffic pattern. This picture right here that I I put is actually of that day of the first time I ever flew as a private pilot by myself um just after work around the pattern a little bit and I was it's funny because I was kind of scared that day of myself I suppose like you know all the, the whole time if I wanted to solo I needed my CFI to you know monitor me like a baby and finally like I'm just like out there on my own but guys it was so peaceful it was so relaxing it was so nice the first time I flew as a private pilot and 
yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I enjoy it. I fly all the time now working on my instrument rating. Um, guys, I have been talking for a half hour and so I'm going to leave you now. Um, if you're preparing for your private pilot check ride, please let me know how you do in the comments below. I really want to know, um, tell me about your private pilot, uh, check ride stories or your other check ride stories in the comments below. If you've been through the check ride mill, I want to hear about them. Um, and happy flying to you all. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.